Section 6 of Astounding Stories, 2nd February, 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathy Wright. Astounding Stories, February, 1930. Adam's voice came in a long mocking challenge. I shall be what no other gods before me have been, a good sport. I'll leave you both to your own devices, until I want you again. White-lipped and trembling, Northwood groaned. What has he done now? Dr. Munson's great head drooped. I don't know. Our bodies are electric and chemical machines and a superior intelligence has discovered new laws of which you and I are ignorant. But Athalia, she is safe. He loves her. Loves her? Northwood shivered. I cannot believe that those freezing eyes could ever look with love on a woman. Adam is a man. At heart he is as woman as the first creature that wallowed on the new earth's slime. His voice dropped as though he were musing aloud. It might be well to let him have Athalia. She will help to keep vigor in the new race, which would stop reproducing in another few generations without injection of black age blood. Do you want to bring more creatures like Adam into the world? Northwood flung at him. You have tampered with life enough, Dr. Munson. But although Adam has my sympathy, I'm not willing to turn Athalia over to him. Well said. Now come to the laboratory for chemical nourishment and rest under the life ray. They went to the great circular building, from whose highest tower issued the golden radiance that shamed the light of the sun, hanging low in the northeast. "'John Northwood,' said Dr. Munson, "'with that laboratory, which is center of all life in New Eden, we'll have to whip Adam.' He gave us what he called a sporting chance, because— he knew that he is able to send us and all mankind to a doom more terrible than hell. Even now, we might be entering some hideous trap that he has set for us. They entered by a side entrance and went immediately to what Dr. Munson called the rest ward. Here in a large room were ranged rows of cots, on many of which lay men basking in the deep orange flood of light which poured from individual lamps set above each cot. It is the life ray, said Dr. Munson reverently. The source of all growth and restoration in nature. It is the power that bursts open the seed and brings forth the shoot that increases the shoot into a giant tree. It is the same power that enables the fertilized ovum to develop into an animal. It creates and recreates cells almost instantly. Accordingly, it is the perfect substitute for sleep. Stretch out, enjoy its power, and while you rest, Eat some nourishing tablets. Northwood lay on a cot, and Dr. Munson turned the life ray on him. For a few minutes a delicious drowsiness fell upon him, producing a spell of perfect peace which the cells of his being seemed to drink in. For another delirious fleeting space every inch of him vibrated with a thrilling sensation of freshness, he took a deep, ecstatic breath and opened his eyes. Enough, said Dr. Munson, switching off the ray. After three minutes of rejuvenation, you are commencing again with perfect cells. 
All ravages from disease and wear have been corrected. Northwood leaped up joyously. His handsome eyes sparkled. His skin glowed. I feel great. Never felt so good since I was a kid. A pleased grin spread over the scientist's homely face. See what my discovery will mean to the world? In the future, we shall all go to the laboratory for recuperation and nourishment. We'll have almost twenty-four hours a day for work and play. He stretched out on the bed contentedly. Some day, when my work is nearly done, I shall permit the life ray to cure my hump. Why not now? Dr. Munson sighed. If I were perfect, I should cease to be so overwhelmingly conscious of the importance of perfection. He settled back to enjoyment of the life ray. A few minutes later, he jumped up, alert as a boy. Ach, that's fine. Now I'll show you how the life ray speeds up development and produces four generations of humans a year. With restored energy, Northwood began thinking of Athalia. As he followed Dr. Munson down a long corridor, he yearned to see her again, to be certain that she was safe. Once he imagined he felt a gentle, soft flesh touch against his hand, and was disappointed not to see her walking by his side. Was she with him, unseen? The thought was sweet. Before Dr. Munson opened the massive bronze door at the end of the corridor, he said, Don't be surprised or shocked over anything you see here, John Northwood. This is the baby laboratory. They entered a room which seemed no different from a hospital ward. On little white beds lay naked children of various sizes, perfect, solemn-eyed youngsters, and older children as beautiful as animated statues. Above each bed was a small life-ray projector. A white-capped nurse went from bed to bed. They are recuperating from the daily educational period said the scientist. After a few minutes of this, they will go into the growing room, which I shall have to show you through a window. Should you and I enter, we might be changed in a most extraordinary manner, he laughed mischievously. But look, Northwood. He slid back a panel in the wall, and Northwood peered in through a thick pane of clear glass. The room was really an immense outdoor arena, its only carpet the fine-bladed grass, its roof the blue sky cut in the middle by an enormous disk, from which shot the aurora of trapped sunshine, which made a golden umbrella over the valley. Through openings in the bottom of the disk poured a fine rain of rays which fell constantly upon groups of children youths and young girls, all clad in the merest straps of clothing. Some were dancing, others were playing games, but all seemed as supremely happy as the birds and butterflies which fluttered about the shrubs and flowers edging the arena. "'I don't expect you to believe,' said Dr. Munson, "'that the oldest young man in there is three months old.' You cannot see visible changes in a body which grows as slowly as the human being, whose normal period of development is twenty years or more. But I can give you visible proof of how fast growth takes place under the full power of the life ray, plant life which, even when left to nature, often develops from seed to flower within a few weeks or months, can be seen making its miraculous changes under the life ray. Watch those gorgeous purple flowers over which the butterflies are hovering. Northwood followed his pointing finger. 
Near the glass window through which they looked grew an enormous bank of resplendent violet-colored flowers, which literally enshrouded the entire bush with their royal glory. At first glance it seemed as though a violent wind were snatching at flower and bush, but closer inspection proved that the agitation was part of the plant itself, and then he saw that the movements were the result of perpetual composition and growth. He fastened his eyes on one huge bud. He saw it swell, burst, spread out its passionate purple velvet, lift the broad flower face to the light for a joyous minute. A few seconds later a butterfly lighted airily to sample its nectar and to brush the pollen from its yellow-dusted wings. Scarcely had the winged visitor flown away than the purple petals began to wither and fall away leaving the seed-pod on the stem. The visible change went on in this seed-pod. It turned rapidly brown, dried out, and then sent the released seeds in a shower to the rich black earth below. Scarcely had the seeds touched the ground than they sent up tiny green shoots that grew larger each moment. Within ten minutes there was a new plant a foot high. Within half an hour the plant budded, blossomed and cast forth its own seed you understand asked the scientist development is going on as rapidly among the children before the first year has passed the youngest baby will have grandchildren that is if the baby tests out fit to pass its seed down to the new generation I know it sounds absurd, yet you saw the plant. But, Doctor, Northwood rubbed his jaw thoughtfully, nature's forces of destruction, of tearing down, are as powerful as her creative powers. You have discovered the ultimate in creation and upbuilding, but perhaps, oh Lord, it is too awful to think. Speak, Northwood. The scientist's voice was impatient. It is, it's nothing. The pale young man attempted a smile. I, I was only imagining some of the horror that could be thrust on the world if a supermind like Adam's should discover nature's secret of death and destruction and speed it up as you have sped the life force. Oh, God! Dr. Munson's face was white. He has his own laboratory, where he works every day. Don't talk so loud. He might be listening, and I believe he can do anything he sets out to accomplish. Close to Northwood's ear fell a faint, triumphant whisper. Yes, he can do anything. How did you guess, Worm? It was Adam's voice. Now come and see the Leyden jar mothers, said Dr. Munson. We don't wait for the child to be born to start our work. He took Northwood to a laboratory crowded with strange apparatus, where young men and women worked. Northwood knew instantly that these people, although unusually handsome and strong, were not of Adam's generation. None of them had the look of newness which marked those who had grown up under the life-ray. They are the perfect couples, whom I combed the world to find, said the scientist. From their eugenic marriages sprang the first children that passed through the laboratory. I had hoped, he hesitated, and looked sideways at Northwood. I had dreamed of having the children of you and Athelia to help strengthen the new race. A wave of sudden disgust passed over Northwood. Thanks, he said tartly. When I marry Athelia, I intend to have an old-fashioned home and a black-age family. I don't relish having my children turned into experiments. But wait until you see all the wonders of the laboratory. That is why I am showing you all of this. Northwood drew his handkerchief and mopped his brow. 
It sickens me, doctor. The more I see, the more pity I have for Adam, and the less I blame him for his rebellion and his desire to kill and to rule. Heavens, what a terrible thing you have done, experimenting with human life. Nonsense! Can you say that all life, all matter, is not the result of scientific experiment, can you? His black gaze made Northwood uncomfortable. Buck up, young friend, for now I am going to show you a marvelous improvement on nature's bungling ways. The Leyden Jar Mother. He raised his voice and called, Lilith! The woman whom they had met on the field came forward. May we take a peep at Lona's twins? asked the scientist. They are about ready to go to the growing dome, are they not? In five more minutes, said the woman, come, see. She lifted one of the black velvet curtains that lined an entire side of the laboratory, and thereby disclosed a globular jar of glass and metal, connected by wires to a dynamo. Above the jar was a life-ray projector. Lilith slid aside a metal portion of the jar, disclosing through the glass underneath the squirming, kicking body of a baby resting on a bed of soft, spongy substance, to which it was connected by the navel cord. "'The Leyden Jar Mother,' said Dr. Munson. "'It is the dream of a scientist realized.' The human mother's body does nothing but nourish and protect her unborn child, a job which science can do better. And so, in New Eden, we take the young embryo and place it in the Leyden jar mother, where the life ray, electricity, and chemical food shortens the period of gestation to a few days. At that moment, a bell under the laden jar began to ring. Dr. Munson uncovered the jar and lifted out the child, a beautiful, perfectly formed boy, who began to cry lustily. Here is one baby who will never be kissed, he said. He'll be nourished chemically, and at the end of the week, will no longer be a baby. If you are patient, you can actually see the process of development taking place under the life ray, for babies develop very fast. Northwood buried his face in his hands. Lord, this is awful. No childhood? No mother to mold his mind? No parents to watch over him, to give him their tender care? Awful! Little sticks! Come see how children get their education, how they learn to use their hands and feet, so they need not pass through the awkwardness of childhood. He led Northwood to a magnificent building, whose façade of white marble was as simply beautiful as a Greek temple. The side walls, built almost entirely of glass, permitted the synthetic sunshine to sweep from end to end. They first entered a library where youths and young girls pored over books of all kinds. Their manner of reading mystified Northwood. With a single sweep of the eye, they seemed to devour a page and then turned to the next. He stepped closer to peer over the shoulder of a beautiful girl. She was reading Euclid's Elements of Geometry in Latin, and she turned the pages as swiftly as the other girl occupying her table, who was devouring Paradise Lost. Dr. Munson whispered to him, If you do not believe that Ruth here is getting her Euclid, which she probably never saw before today, examine her from the book. That is, if you are a good enough Latin scholar. Ruth stopped her reading to talk to him, and in a few minutes, had completely dumbfounded him with her pedantic replies, which fell from lips as luscious and unformed as an infant's. Now, said Dr. Munson, test the Rachel on her Milton. 
as far as she has read. She should not misquote a line, and her comments will probably prove her scholarly appreciation of Milton. Word for word, Rachel was able to give him Paradise Lost, from memory, except the last four pages, which she had not read. Then, taking the book from him, she swept her eyes over these pages, returned the book to him, and quoted copiously and correctly. Dr. Munson gloated triumphantly over his astonishment. "'There, my friend, would you now be satisfied with old-fashioned children who spend long, expensive years in getting an education? Of course, your children will not have the perfect brains of these. Yet, developed under the life-ray, they should have splendid mentality. These children, through selective breeding, have brains that make everlasting records instantly. A page in a book, once seen, is indelibly retained by them and understood. The same is true of a lecture, of an explanation given by a teacher, of even idle conversation. Any man or woman in this room should be able to repeat the most trivial conversation days old. But what of the arts, Dr. Munson? Surely even your supermen and women cannot instantly learn to paint a masterpiece, or to guide their fingers and their brains through the intricacies of a difficult musical composition. No? His dark eyes glowed. Come see. Before they entered another wing of the building, they heard a violin being played masterfully. Dr. Munson paused at the door. So that you may understand what you shall see, let me remind you that the nerve impulses and the coordinating means in the human body are purely electrical. The world has not yet accepted my theory, but it will. Under Superman's system of education, the instantaneous records made on the brain give immediate skill to the acting parts of the body. Accordingly, musicians are made overnight. He threw open the door. Under a life-ray projector, a beautiful Juno-esque woman was playing a violin. Facing her, and with eyes fastened to hers, stood a young man, whose arms and slender fingers mimicked every motion she made. Presently she stopped playing and handed the violin to him. In her own masterly manner, he repeated the score she had played. "'That is Eve,' whispered Dr. Munson. "'I had selected her as Adam's wife, but he does not want her, the most brilliant woman of the new race.' Northwood gave the woman an appraising look. "'Who wants a perfect woman? I don't blame Adam for preferring Athalia.' How is she teaching her pupil? Through thought vibration, which these perfect people have developed until they can record permanently the radioactive waves of the brains of others. Eve turned, caught Northwood's eyes in her magnetic blue gaze, and smiled as only a goddess can smile upon a mortal she has marked as her own. She came toward him with outflung hands. "'So you have come!' Her vibrant contralto voice, like Adam's, held the bird-like broken tremulo of a young child's. "'I have been waiting for you, John Northwood!' Her eyes, as blue and icy as Adam's, lingered long on him, until he flinched from their steely magnetism. She slipped her arm through his and drew him gently but firmly from the room while Dr. Munson stood gaping after them. They were on a flagged terrace, arched with roses of gigantic size, which sent forth billows of sensuous fragrance. Eve led him to a white marble seat piled with silk cushions, on which she reclined her superb body, 
while she regarded him from narrow lids. "'I saw your picture that he television to Athalia,' she said. "'What a botch Dr. Munson has made of his mating!' Her laugh rippled like falling water. "'I want you, John Northwood!' Northwood started and blushed furiously. Smile dimples broke around her red, humid lips. "'Ah, you're old-fashioned!' Her large, beautiful hand, flushed more tenderly than any woman's hand he had ever seen, went out to him appealingly. "'I can bring you amorous delights that your Athalia never could offer in her few years of youth. And I'll never grow old, John Northwood.' She came closer until he could feel the fragrant warmth of her tawny, ribbon-bound hair pulse against his face. In sudden panic he drew back. "'But I am pledged to Athalia,' tumbled from him. "'It is all a dreadful mistake, Eve. You and Adam were created for each other.' Hush! The lightning that flashed from her blue eyes changed her from seductress to angry goddess. "'Created for each other? Who wants a made-to-measure lover?' The luscious lips trembled slightly and into the vivid eyes crept a suspicion of moisture. Eternal Eve's weapons. Northwood's handsome face relaxed with pity. I want you, John Northwood, she continued shamelessly. Our love will be sublime. She leaned heavily against him, and her lips were like a blood-red flower pressed against white satin. Come, beloved, kiss me. Northwood gasped and turned his head. Don't, Eve. But a kiss from me will set you apart from all your generation, John Northwood, and you shall understand what no man of the black age could possibly fathom. Her hair had partly fallen from its ribbon bondage and poured its fragrant gold against his shoulder. For God's sakes, don't tempt me, he groaned. What do you mean? That mental and physical and spiritual contact with me will temporarily give you a three-dimension creature, the power of the new sense which your race will not have for fifty thousand years. White-lipped and trembling, he demanded, Explain! Eve smiled. Have you not guessed that Adam has developed an additional sense? You've seen him vanish. He and I have the sixth sense of time perception, the new sense which enables us to penetrate what you of the Black Age call the fourth dimension. Even you, whose mentalities are framed by three dimensions, have this sixth sense instinct. Your very religion is based on it, for you believe that in another life you shall step into time, or, as you call it, eternity. She leaned closer, so that her hair brushed his cheek. What is eternity, John Northwood? Is it not keeping forever ahead of the destroyer? The future is eternal, for it is never reached. Adam and I, through our new sense, which comprehends time and space, can vanish by stepping a few seconds into the future, the fourth dimension of space. Death can never reach us not even accidental death, unless that which causes death could also slip into the future, which is not yet possible. But if the fourth dimension is future time, why can one in the third dimension feel the touch of an unseen presence in the fourth dimension, hear his voice even? Thought vibration. The touch is not really felt, nor the voice heard. They are only imagined. The radioactive waves of the brain of even you black age people are swift enough to bridge space and time, and it is the mind that carries us beyond the third dimension. Her red mouth reached closer to him. Her blue eyes touched hidden forces that slept in remote cells of his being. You are going into eternal time, John Northwood, eternity without beginning or end. You understand? You feel it? Comprehend it? Now for the contact. 
Kiss me. Northwood had seen Athalia vanish under Adam's kiss. Suddenly, in one mad burst of understanding, he leaned over to his magnificent temptress. For a split second he felt the sweet pressure of baby-soft lips, and then the atoms of his body seemed to fly asunder. Black chaos held him for a frightful moment before he felt sanity return. He was back on the terrace again, with Eve by his side. They were standing now. The world about him looked the same, yet there was a subtle change in everything. Eve laughed softly. It is puzzling, isn't it? You're seeing everything as in a mirror. What was left before is now right. Only you and I are real. All else is but a vision, a dream. For now you and I are existing one minute in future time. Or, more simply, we are in the fourth dimension. To everything in the third dimension, we are invisible. Let me show you that Dr. Munson cannot see you. They went back to the room beyond the terrace. Dr. Munson was not present. There he goes, down the jungle path, said Eve, looking out a window. She laughed. Poor old fellow. The children of his genius are worrying him. They were standing in the recess formed by a bay window. Eve picked up his hand and laid it against her face, giving him the full, blasting glory of her smiling blue eyes. Northwood, looking away miserably, uttered a low cry. Coming over the field beyond were Adam and Athalia. By the trimming on the blue dress she wore, he could see that she was still in the fourth dimension, for he did not see her as a mirror image. A look of fear leaped to Eve's face. She clutched Northwood's arm, trembling. I don't want Adam to see that I have passed you beyond, she gasped. We are existing but one minute in the future. Always Adam and I have feared to pass too far beyond the sweetness of reality. But now, so that Adam may not see us, we shall step five minutes into what is yet to be. And even he, with all his power, cannot see into a future that is more distant than that in which he exists. She raised her humid lips to his. Come, beloved. Northwood kissed her. Again came the moment of confusion, of the awful vacancy that was like death. And then he found himself and Eve in the laboratory, following Adam and Athalia down a long corridor. Athalia was crying and pleading frantically with Adam. Once she stopped and threw herself at his feet in a gesture of dramatic supplication, arms outflung, streaming eyes wide open with fear. Adam stooped and lifted her gently and continued on his way, supporting her against his side. Eve dug her fingers into Northwood's arm. Horror contorted her face, horror mixed with rage. My mind hears what he is saying, understands the vile plan he has made John Northwood. He is on his way to his laboratory to destroy not only you and most of these in New Eden, but me as well. He wants only a failure. Striding forward like an avenging goddess, she pulled Northwood after her. Hurry, she whispered. Remember, you and I are five minutes in the future, and Adam is only one. We are witnessing what will occur four minutes from now. We yet have time to reach the laboratory before him, and be ready for him when he enters. And because he will have to go back to present time to do his work of destruction, I will be able to destroy him. Ah! Fierce joy burned in her flashing blue eyes, and her slender nostrils quivered delicately. Northwood, peeping at her in horror, knew that no mercy could be expected of her, and when she stopped at a certain door and inserted a key, he remembered Athalia. What if she should enter with Adam in present time? They were inside Adam's laboratory a huge apartment filled with queer apparatus and cages of live animals. The room was a strange paradox. Part of the equipment, the walls, and the floor was glistening with newness. 
and part was moulding with extreme age. The powers of disintegration that haunt a tropical forest seemed to be devouring certain spots of the room. Here, in the midst of bright marble, was a section of wall that seemed as old as the pyramids. The surface on the stone had an appalling moldenness, as though it had been lifted from an ancient graveyard where it had lain in the festering ground for unwholesome centuries. Between cracks in this stained and decayed section of stone grew fetid moss that quivered with the microscopic organisms that infest age-rotten places. Sections of the flooring and woodwork also reeked with mustiness. In one dark, webby corner of the room lay a pile of bleached bones, still tinted with the ghastly grays and pinks of putrefaction. Northwood, overwhelmingly nauseated, withdrew his eyes from the bones only to see in another corner a pile of worm-eaten clothing that lay on the floor in the outline of a man. Faint with the reek of ancient mustiness, Northwood retreated to the door, dizzy and staggering. It sickens you, said Eve, and it sickens me also, for death and decay are not pleasant. Yet nature, left to herself, reduces all to this. Every grave that has yawned to receive its prey hides corruption no less shocking. Nature's forces of creation and destruction forever work in partnership. Never satisfied with her composition, she destroys and starts again, building, building towards the ultimate of perfection. Thus, it is natural that if Dr. Munson isolated the life-ray, nature's supreme force of compensation, isolation of the death-ray, should closely follow. Adam, thirsting for power, has succeeded. A few sweeps of his unholy ray of decomposition will undo all Dr. Munson's work in this valley and reduce it to a stinking holocaust of destruction. And the time for this striking has come. She seized his face and drew it toward her. Quick, she said. We'll have to go back to the third dimension. I could leave you safe in the fourth, but if anything should happen to me, you would be stranded forever in future time. She kissed his lips. In a moment he was back in the old familiar world, where right is right and left is left. Again the subtle change wrought by Eve's magic lips had taken place. Eve went to a machine standing in the corner of the room. Come here and get behind me, John Northwood. I want to test it before he enters. Northwood stood behind her shoulder. Now watch, she ordered. I shall turn it on one of those cages of guinea pigs over there. She swung the projector around, pointed it at the cage of small, squealing animals, and threw a lever. Instantly a cone of black mephitis shot forth, a loathsome, bituminous stream of putrefaction that reeked of the grave and the cesspool of the utmost reaches of decay before the dust accepts the disintegrated atoms. The first touch of seething, pitchy destruction brought screams of sudden agony from the guinea pigs, but the screams were cut short as the little animals fell in shocking, instant decay. The very cage which imprisoned them shriveled and retreated from the hellish, devouring breath that struck its noisome rot into the heart of the wood and the metal, reducing both to revolting ruin. Eve cut off the frightful power and the black cone disappeared, leaving the room putrid with its defilement. "'And Adam would do that to the world,' she said, her blue eyes like electric-shot icicles. "'He would do it to you, John Northwood, and to me.' Her full bosom strained under the passion beneath. "'Listen,' she raised her hand warningly. "'He comes. The destroyer comes.' A hand was at the door, Eve reached for the lever, and the same moment Northwood leaned over her imploringly. "'If Athalia is with him,' he gasped, "'you will not harm her.' A wild shriek at the door, a slight scuffle, and then the doorknob was wrenched as though two were fighting over it. "'For God's sake, Eve,' implored Northwood, "'wait! Wait!' "'No! She shall die, too!' 
You love her. Icy, cruel eyes cut into him, and a new, flushed hand tried to push him aside. The door was straining open. A beloved voice shrieked, John! Eve and Northwood both leaped for the lever. Under her tender white flesh, she was as strong as a man. In the midst of the struggle, her red, humid lips approached his, closer, closer. Their merest pressure would thrust him into future time, where the laboratory and all it contained would be but a shadow, and where he would be helpless to interfere with her terrible will. He saw the door open and Adam stride into the room. Behind him, lying prone in the hall where she had probably fainted, was Athalia. In a mad burst of strength, he touched the lever together with Eve. The projector belching forth its stinking breath of corruption, swung in a mad arc over the ceiling, over the walls, and then straight at Adam. Then, quicker than thought, came the accident. Eve, attempting to throw Northwood off, tripped, fell half over the machine, and with a short scream of despair dropped into the black path of destruction. Northwood paused, horrified, the death ray was pointed at an inner wall of the room, which, even as he looked, crumbled and disappeared, bringing down upon him dust more foul than any obscenity the bowels of the earth might yield. In an instant, the black cone ate through the outer parts of the building, where crashing stone and screams that were more horrible because of their shortness followed the ruin that swept far into the far reaches of the valley. The paralyzing odor of decay took his breath, numbed his muscle, until, of all that huge building, the wall behind him and one small section of the room by the doorway alone remained whole. He was trying to nerve himself to reach for the lever close to that quiet formless thing still partly draped over the machine, when a faint sound in the door electrified him. At first he dared not look but his own name, spoken almost in a gasp, gave him courage. Athalia lay on the floor, apparently untouched. He jerked the lever violently before running to her, exultant with the knowledge that his own efforts to keep the ray from the door had saved her. And you're not hurt, he gathered her close. John, I saw it get Adam, she pointed to a new mound of moldy clothes on the floor. Oh, it is hideous for me to be so glad, but he was going to destroy everything and everyone except me. He made the ray projector for that one purpose. Northwood looked over the pile of putrid ruins, which a few minutes ago had been a building. There was not a wall left intact. His intention is accomplished, Athalia, he said sadly. Let's get out before more stones fall. In a moment they were in the open. An ominous stillness seemed to grip the very air, the awful silence of the polar waste which lay not far beyond the mountains. "'How dark it is, John!' cried Athalia. "'Dark and cold! The sunshine projector!' gasped Northwood. "'It must have been destroyed. Look, dearest, the golden light has disappeared!' and the warm air of the valley will lift immediately. That means a polar blizzard, she shuddered and clung closer to him. I've seen Antarctic storms, John. They're death. Northwood avoided her eyes. Northwood avoided her eyes. There's the sunship. We'll give the ruins the once over in case there are any survivors. Then we'll save ourselves. Even a cursory examination of the moldy piles of stone and dust convinced them that there could be no survivors. The ruins looked as though they had lain in those crumbling piles for centuries. Northwood, smothering his repugnance, stepped among them, among the green, slimy stones and the unspeakable, revolting debris, staggering back and faint and shocked when he came upon dust that was once human. God, he groaned, hands over eyes. We're alone, Athalia. Alone in a charnel house. 
The laboratory housed the entire population, didn't it? Yes. Needing no sleep for food, we did not need houses. We all worked here, under Dr. Munson's generalship, and lately under Adams, like a little band of soldiers fighting for a great cause. Let's go to the sunship, dearest. But Daddy Munson was in the library, sobbed Athalia. Let's look for him a little longer. Sudden remembrance came to Northwood. No, Athalia. He left the library. I saw him go down the jungle path several minutes before I and Eve went to Adam's laboratory. Then he might be safe, her eyes danced. He might have gone to the sunship. Shivering, she slumped against him. Oh, John, I'm cold. Her face was blue. Northwood jerked off his coat and wrapped it around her, taking the intense cold against his unprotected shoulders. The low, gray sky was rapidly darkening, and the feeble light of the sun could scarcely pierce the clouds. It was disturbing to know that even the summer temperature in the Antarctic was far below zero. "'Come, girl,' said Northwood gravely. "'Hurry! It's snowing!' They started to run down the road through the narrow strip of jungle. The death ray had cut huge swatches in the tangle of trees and vines, and now areas of heaped debris, livid with the colors of recent decay, exhaled a mephitic humidity altogether alien to the snow that fell in soft, slow flakes. Each hesitated to voice the new fear. Had the sunship been destroyed? By the time they reached the open field, the snow stung their flesh like sharp needles, but it was not yet thick enough to hide from them a hideous fact. The sunship was gone. It might have occupied one of the several foul areas on the green grass, where the searching death ray had made the very soil putrefy and the rocks crumbling into shocking dust. Northwood snatched Athalia to him, too full of despair to speak. A sudden terrific flurry of snow whirled around them, and they were almost blown from their feet by the icy wind that tore over the unprotected field. It won't be long said Athalia faintly. Freezing doesn't hurt, John, dear. It isn't fair, Athalia. There never would have been such a marriage as ours. Dr. Munson searched the world to bring us together. For scientific experiment, she sobbed. I'd rather die, John. I want an old-fashioned home, a black age family. I want to grow old with you and leave the earth to my children. Or else I want to die here now under the kind white blanket the snow is already spreading over us. She drooped her arms. Clinging together, they stood in the howling wind, looking at each other hungrily, as though they would snatch from death this one last picture of the other. Northwood's freezing lips translated some of the futile words that crowded against them. I love you because you are not perfect. I hate perfection. Yes, perfection is the only hopeless state, John. That is why Adam wanted to destroy, so that he might build again. They were sitting in the snow now, for they were very tired. The storm began whistling louder, as though it were only a few feet above their heads. That sounds almost like the sunship said Athalia, drowsily. It's only the wind. Hold your face down so it won't strike your flesh so cruelly. I'm not suffering. I'm getting warm again. She smiled at him sleepily. Little icicles began to form on their clothing, and the powdery snow frosted their uncovered hair. Suddenly came a familiar voice. Hock Gott! Dr. Munson stood before them, covered with snow until he looked like a polar bear. Get up, he shouted. Quick, to the sunship! He seized Athalia and jerked her to her feet. She looked at him sleepily for a moment, and then threw herself at him and hugged him frantically. You're not dead! Taking each by the arm, he half dragged them to the sunship, which had landed only a few feet away. In a few minutes, he had hot brandy for them. While they sipped greedily, 
he talked between working the sunship's controls. No, I wouldn't say it was lucky moment that drew me to the sunship. When I saw Eve trying to charm John, I had what you American slangists call a hunch, which sent me to the sunship to get it off the ground so that Adam couldn't commandeer it. And what is a hunch but a mental penetration into the fourth dimension? For a long moment he brooded, absent-minded. I was in the air when the black ray, which I suppose is Adam's deviltry, began to destroy everything it touched. From a safe elevation, I saw it wreck all my work. A sudden spasm crossed his face. I've flown over the entire valley. We're the only survivors. Thank God. And so at last you confess that it was not well to tamper with human life? Northwood warmed with hot brandy, was his old self again. Oh, I have not altogether wasted my efforts. I went to elaborate pains to bring together a perfect man and a perfect woman of what Adam called our black age. He smiled at them whimsically. And who can say to what extent you have thus furthered natural evolution? Northwood slipped his arm around Athalia. Our children might be more than geniuses, doctor. Dr. Munson nodded his huge, shaggy head gravely. The true instinct of a creature of the light, he declared. End of section 6